thank you. Um, yeah, let's get started right away. Uh, so we're going to talk some, uh, discuss something about wireless industrial sensor networks. Um, just quickly, who we are. My name is Erwin. That is right next to me, uh, both for Nixu. And as you see, we haven't traveled that far today. Uh, we did the, the talk earlier at DEF CON was a different graph over there. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about wireless industrial sensor networks, but maybe interesting to also look a bit at the past, like what has been out there. Um, so this is industrial environments. You have uh, a system uh, originally that used uh, work with air pressure, basically to move valves, to, to move uh, things around. And then they changed to analog, so they, to electrical signals, uh, so current loop, uh, 4 to uh, 20 milliampers. And then they moved on to Hart. Uh, we also have Alexander Bolshev here, who has done a lot of work research in that area. Um, so, Kosvi his uh, previous talks about that part. But we're here more about to discuss the, the wireless mesh network. So, Wireless Hart, which was released in uh, 2007, and ISA 100, released in 2009. And if you wonder where these devices are actually used, you can see. Uh, a picture over there of an oil field, so gas pipelines, oil fields, those kind of things. And I actually have a device with me here as well. Um, it's this one, and this is actually normally put in a tank, so it will measure liquid level. So it will be stuck in a tank, and then it will measure if, it re if the liquid reaches up to the to the fork, basically. You can also see the wireless antenna on there. Um, Another thing is, uh, since I'm standing here right now, is the gateway. As I have a picture on the on the on the next slide. This is the the central gateway with the, where the transmitter is communi uh, communicating with. So this is what you typically see out there in the field. It's all uh, metal, can withstand explosions, things like that. So it's uh, you can actually take it in the shopping bag and it won't break. So there is some previous research done in this field. So actually already in 2009, there was more academic research done by uh, Shahid Raza. Uh, he, he looked at the protocols and, and, and already identified the vulnerabilities. Um, but I've, from what I've seen, this is mainly a paper exercise, or at least he didn't release any tools or anything. Um, then there was a, a, a Dutch intern who did an internship at Fox IT and looked at wireless hard as well. His uh, master thesis was, uh, was published. And he tried a combination of SDR, uh, so software-defined radio, and some uh, specific um, embedded uh, modules in combination with Linux. In the end, he didn't really succeed in in um, in, in making uh, setting up the communication with with wireless heart. So we uh, did earlier research, uh, and that was presented at S4. Then we also looked at uh, wireless heart, and then we already came up with the idea like, hey, there's basically no tools out there. So we should look into something to, to make this work more easily because, I mean, for Wi-Fi, there are a dozen of tools and, and hardware out there. The same is not true for, for wireless heart. And we'll get back to that later in the presentation. So um, earlier this year, so in January this year, um, Blake Johnson also did a, did a presentation, uh, again, based on SDRs, but nothing was released. So no code, no, no, no tools, nothing. So basically, after we've done the research in 2016, basically nothing happened. There's still no tools out there. So that's why we decided, well, actually, we want to create those tools to actually advance this field uh, of, of, of research. Um, just a step back. Um, what are we looking at? Well, industrial processes, and they typically have a control loop. So they have, for instance, a flow transmitter here that sends a signal about maybe a flow rate or temperature, pressure, whatever. Sends it to a central system, so uh, that's called the process value. That's actually checked against the set value, so is it within range or is it not within range? If it's not within range, we actually have to change something. So then we get controller output, goes back to the flow control valve, and then actually something changes. So uh, maybe a valve is closed, things like that. So that's typically what you see in in in, uh, in process control systems, and up to now you see mostly that that ISO 100 and wireless heart are used in the the measuring part. So the the first uh, line going up that measures the flow rate in this uh, this case. 
So some, some introduction about wireless heart. It's actually um, the same, same heart application layer. That's why I also refer, refer to, uh, to Alexander's work he's done before. Uh, but they actually put a wireless uh, layer underneath it and they, they reuse the same application layer uh, protocol. Um, uses a single encryption uh, key cipher length, AES CCM star. And uh, we get uh, back to that in, in a couple of slides, about a bit more about what keys we have. And uh, the wireless technology is actually based on a time sync mesh protocol, which was developed by Dust Networks, which was taken over by Linear and now is part of analog devices. So they're still around, but they, uh, they were bought a couple of times. Um, and, and, and you see that, that there's different vendors out there, but from what we've seen till now, all the radio socks are actually still by Dust Network. So it's basically a monoculture, just one, one radio system on a chip. So if we look at ISO 100, it's a bit different approach. They rely on several standards. So they use six low of WPAN, which is actually a sort of light IPv6 combined with UDP. And they have also the ability to tunnel other protocols. So let's say you have legacy protocols, uh, like maybe Hart, you can tunnel all this as well. And they have their own vendor neutral application layer, although Hart is, 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 is uh, nowadays such a standard that it's, it's also not tied to one vendor. Uh, but at least the, the approach was, was a little bit different. Um, was mainly developed by a company called Nifis. They also have, uh, they developed also a sort of development kit, which is a gateway with some, some, some uh, transmitters. And uh, there's, there's a couple of vendors out there, not that many as for, for wireless hard. So here we see the same gateway again, I just showed you. So that is one in the field. And this is what a typical uh, network looks like. So you have the, the blue box is actually the gateway uh, network manager and security manager in one. So there's three different roles, but they're all in one box, basically. It has an Ethernet interface, so you connect it to the rest of your plant automation network. And the other side, it has the wireless interface we're going to talk more about. Um, you see field devices uh, in, in, on, on the picture as well. I just showed you one. So that's the transmitter, is actually field device. Um, you also have uh, maybe the old hard devices that don't have the wireless part yet. Then you can actually use an adapter that, that supports the, the wireless part. Um, you also see the wireless hard handheld, and it's actually being used to uh, configure the, the encryption keys into the device. Uh, so it's actually uh, the same old hard interface that can be used to actually configure it before you can, you can actually join the network. Um, they, uh, also, some of the vendors allow you to, uh, to specify the value. So basically, you need a network ID and uh, an encryption key and those can be programmed into the devices from the factory. But that would also mean that they know what key you use. So if we look at the protocol stack, um, you actually see that there is, there's, there's common uh, layers for hard and wireless hard. Um, and uh, the top layers, I mean, the bottom layers are, of course, different. And, and you also see that if you compare it to ISO 100, that actually the bottom layers are quite similar. They both use uh, 802.15.4, both make a file layer, and then they have an upper layer on the data link layer, which is different. So from there on up, uh, they become different protocols. But on, on the radio level and physical data link level, they're, they're quite similar. So that also um, led us to, to, to um, the, the following, and, and basically we were looking like, okay, Instead of just doing wireless hard, can we actually do two protocols at once? Because they're, they're quite similar. And they, they have more similarities because they both do uh, time slot channel hopping. Um, and that means that they, they switch from channel to channel uh, quite regularly. And Matthijs will tell you more about how regularly. Um, and they do this for, for a couple of reasons. One is to actually uh, minimize interference with other radio signals. For instance, one channel is, is, is jammed. You, the, they will hop to other channels, and they also have blacklist detection. So if there is, a, there is interference on one channel, they can blacklist it at some point and not use the channel anymore. And also for a technique uh, called multipath uh, fading. So imagine you have these networks. There's a lot of metal uh, and, and, and things around. So they will re reflect the signals back. So that would mean that if you 
actually cancel out uh, the, the sending signal with the reflected signal, it basically becomes quiet. It's a bit the same like how noise cancellation headphones work. It's basically you create anti-sound to filter out the sound. And, and that's what they try to prevent, so they, that's why they help uh, over different frequencies. So we uh, actually uh, thought, well, maybe we can, we can build a common sniffer for both protocols. Um, but yeah, of course, there's also some security involved. These are protocols that are known in the ICS world as secure. Um, so compared to the many other protocols, they're not doing a bad job. I mean, at least they have some encryption. So they use AES on two levels. So on the data link layer, they use it only for integrity to make sure uh, that the integrity is correct. And on the transport layer, they, they also use it for encryption. And they have a joint process, and that's actually done with, uh, with the network manager, so the central box basically in the network. And, um, but they, they do work with shared secrets. I mean, it's, it's in a symmetric encryption, so you have shared secrets, and how do you get these across? Um, like I said, for, for wireless heart, uh, they, you can configure them themselves with, uh, with a heart uh, device, so you actually have to connect that to the, to the wireless heart transmitters that typically do that on a bench. Uh, but ISO 100 uh, also supports over the air um, provisioning and they also support certificates. So then they use asymmetric encryption for that part. So there's a lot of different keys um, for ISO 100. Uh, there are really a lot of different keys and there's wireless hearts, a few, a few less. Um, but I also put them, uh, put them in the picture and I actually did this last evening. Um, so you see the, the well-known and, and network key. Um, the well-known key is actually documented in the standard, uh, so that, that's actually not, not a secret. And the network key is, is generated. So the well-known key is used for advertisements. Um, so both networks, uh, similar to Wi-Fi, actually advertise that they are a network and, and what their network ID is and also what available slots they have. And Matthijs will, will tell more about that. And they, then they have the, the join key, so that's basically the shared secrets you need to know to join a network. And from that, they generate the broadcast session key and the unicast session key. So both, both those keys are used for encryption of, uh, of data. Now, I'm going to be very honest. Last night, I looked at ISO 100 again, and I was reading the specs. And Matthijs was also looking at the specs, and we're like, huh? How does this actually work? So this is our interpret interpretation of how we think how it works with the keys, because there's a lot of keys, and the specification is not really clear about it. So, uh, so I, I basically split up in two phases. So you have the provisioning phase and the joining phase. So like this is over the air uh, provisioning. Um, so you have a global key, which cannot be changed, but they, and they say they derive keys from it, but they don't tell you which ones. I, at least I haven't found it, so that's why I put it at the bottom. But basically, K-Open and K-Global are used uh, during the provisioning phase, and all those keys are known, actually. So that would mean that if you uh, provision over the air, and you don't use the certificates, and they warn you as well for that in the standard, that if you, if you actually capture that handshake, you, you can actually, in the end, get the join key. So K-Join is, uh, is, is being generated during the provisioning phase. So if you don't do this in a secure way, or you can actually get, uh, get the key. Um, and there's a couple of other keys for the data link layer again. Uh, so that's only uh, integrity and encryption on the transport layer. Um, but again, we, we have to look at how it works in, in detail because we haven't implemented the decryption of key, uh, the decryption of the, the traffic yet. Um, but how do you get the key material? Well, there are a lot of them are in the standards. You also find them in some documents online, although I must uh, say that since we have presented this a couple of years ago, a lot of the documents disappeared somehow. Um, don't know why. Um, over the air provisioning, like I just mentioned, and uh, pro previous research for wireless hard, we also opened up the transmitters, and it turned out that the radio socks actually have debugging interfaces enabled. So you can actually dump the full firmware, and in, in there there's the key. So if you dump the firmware, put it on another device, basically you've cloned the device. So if you ever decommission these transmitters, be very careful before you put them on eBay, because we might buy them. Um, so there's a couple of uh, wireless hard Devil joint keys. Um, well, the first one, uh, so they're all 16, 16 bits, uh, 16 uh, bytes, sorry. Um, 
And and the first one you 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 see a lot because it, well the sock is from those networks and apparently they think they rocked or rock. So there's multiple vendors who use that one, and sometimes uh, they're specific to to uh, to a vendor. So the Pepperell and Thux one, this is not a readable string, but that's one we found in documentation. The Emerson one is an interesting one because that's actually uh, the default one of, I mean, it's not static, but you see it's only a few bytes. It's uh, four bytes that actually are uh, are being generated, and that's the default key. So if you reset it to, to factory default, this is the, the sort of key you end up with. I'm not sure what the first four bytes are. Maybe, maybe it's even something like time or something. We still have to figure out that part. But it's extremely weak key. So if you reset it to factory default, be careful. And there is the, the last one, which basically says, well, Andres and Hauser, but uh, in, in, uh, in hex. So then we started looking around for actually hardware, because we want to sniff the wireless signal. So what's out there? Well, during previous research, we already used the beam logic. Uh, which basically um, has 16 radios and, and um, can capture uh, all, all traffic simultaneously. But it doesn't have um, injection support. And the, uh, the Wireshark dissector is also very basic, so it doesn't decrypt much of the protocols. And it's expensive uh, compared to the other ones. So then we already suggested in the previous presentation, well, let's uh, use the RC, Dra RC Raven stick, uh, which is also uh, used for, uh, for Zigbee research. Same ground layer protocol, ADA215.4. Uh, um, can already sniff on one channel, but um, well, the ED IDE is no longer free or not available anymore because uh, the website changed around. It's hard to find nowadays, and it also reached end of life. It's an 8-bit AVR chip, so it's not the, the, the quickest one around as well. So then we started looking at the NXPB kit. Um, and again, can sniff on one channel, uh, but the firmware is not open source, and it, again, it reached end of life. So we basically started looking for, uh, for other devices, and then we found this one. Again, an NXP device. Um, can sniff on, on one channel, standard firmware, not, not open source again, but at least it's actively supported. It has a free IDE available, uh, quite powerful microcontroller. Um, it allows you to modify the PCB, um, that's the part up here. It's, there you actually have to remove a resistor and, and, uh, and there you can actually add an antenna connector. Um, I must say the first experiments for that Failed because we we ripped out uh, the copper uh, the copper parts because it's all very tiny and fragile. Um, one of my colleagues did a new one, so we hope we get that soon, so then we can start war driving uh, soon. And another convenient thing is that um, it allows you to firm firm firmware through uh, USB mass storage, so that's actually nice if you need to develop firmware. It has quite a lot of documentation and some examples and a few omissions here and there, but overall it's quite good. So um, it also comes with a, with a default application. So it's the Kinetics Protocol Analyzer. Um, it's a Windows application. allows you to uh, select either a 215.4 channel or a Bluetooth Low Energy channel, and you can just sniff with Wireshark on, uh, on one channel. And I'll show you uh, what it looks like. And what we, we just uh, click one channel here, and what we're actually going to sniff here is ISO 100, if I remember correctly. Uh, so for ISO 100 gateway, and basically we see the advertisements. So it, it creates a network interface, and you see the traffic here. But you, you see that basically above the 802.15.4 level, it's just data, because it doesn't know the protocol, it doesn't, it's not able to parse it. But at least the start is there. I mean, we can at least sniff data already uh, on one channel. And the question becomes, well, how does this work actually? And uh, Matthijs is gonna tell you more about it. All right, can you hear me okay? Yes, no, no. Now I'm good to go? All right. <clears throat> So uh, we decided that uh, this uh, this board from NXP would be a good candidate uh, to uh, start building our tool, tool set. Um, well, as Aaron has explained, uh, it has a, a few uh, nice features, like you can program the device by just dragging and dropping the firmware file 
and that's uh, because of uh, the board exists, uh, or contains actually two uh, um, microcontrollers. Uh, the one on the left is uh, mainly for interfacing with USB, and it contains uh, a bootloader that uh, supports programming the other uh, uh, microcontroller. Actually, uh, this one is uh, the one that uh, contains uh, uh, the meat, so here, this is one we, where we're interested in. And uh, um, this package also con contains the radio. Um, <coughs> so uh, we decided uh, uh, to uh, to start with uh, existing tools, the tools. And the Killer Baby framework already supports uh, Zigbee, uh, the Zigbee protocol, uh, which seemed a good start because it shares the 802.50.4 uh, uh, protocol layer. And um, so the first step actually was uh, creating a driver for KillerB for this device. So the NXP software development kit uh, came with a uh, huge library and Python bindings, uh, but actually uh, we thought it would be easier to directly uh, communicate through uh, the serial protocol and uh, yeah actually that's what we did and once we uh, once we completed that we started to, to build uh, scapy detectors and wireshark detectors so um, yeah pretty pretty quickly you had the possibility to not only capture traffic but also inject traffic so of course it was yeah it, it took quite some work to implement these uh, two protocols, ISA 100 and uh, and wireless hard. Um, but well, I will show you how that what that looks like. So if I record a demo here, and I should press another button. Okay. So basically, this is uh, the CB Wireshark tool, which is uh, part of uh, the Killer B framework. And with our new driver for the NXP board, we can capture some traffic. And what you also see here is that we uh, implemented uh, a Wireshark uh, detector for ISA 100. And you can see here the advertisements. Oops. And is that? No. I'll just replay it. No problem. So actually, what you actually can see that uh, the ISA 100 network sends periodic advertisements, and um, it will show quite some useful information. The interesting thing is that both uh, protocols send these advertisements on all available channels, so you can just listen to uh, an arbitrary uh, to a random channel, and you will pick up some of these ad advertisements. But wh when you really want to interact with the, the, this network, uh, you will have to uh, to follow a channel hopping pattern. So uh, what you see here, for both protocols, uh, they have uh, a, a hopping pattern that is determined by, uh, by the standard. And these uh, differ slightly from ISA 100 and uh, and wireless hard, but what they have in common is th uh, that the pattern repeats uh, over the, the available channels, and you can compare this with uh, playing the piano, the same tune over and over and over again. And once you reach a certain number of notes. Uh, say 512, uh, that's called a super frame. And what the network manager actually does is it as assigns a slot within that super frame to a certain device to communicate. So that's what you co can consider the, the communication link. So every device is assigned this slot and is, uh, in that channel it can either send or receive uh, packets. So, 
so uh, how do you tune in? How do you synchronize uh, with uh, this network? Well, you have to do some calculation because uh, wireless hard, uh, once you boot the network, it starts just counting all these slots. And that's what is meant with the sequence number. And yeah, when you start, it starts just with the sequence number zero. The advertisements will show you the current sequence number. So you, um, you can calculate what is uh, uh, derived from the current slot at what channel it currently is uh, sending. Um, ISA 100 has a slightly different approach. So it uses uh, uh, atomic time uh, uh, stems, international atomic time stems, uh, which starts counting uh, January 1st, 1958. Uh, but um, yeah, it, it has a, a similar way of, uh, of uh, um, well, it, it's a different formula, obviously. But uh, in a similar way, you can derive what uh, channel the network or a, a, a com communication link between two devices uh, on which channel it will be sending traffic. So actually, in one time slot, um, you see on the top here, actually, a device can both send uh, uh, traffic and the receiving end can send an acknowledgement within the same frame. So uh, that's where the nightmare started. How are we going to uh, to implement this? Because our ultimate goal was actually to interact with uh, with our USB uh, device. And yeah, the that starts with uh, following the same, uh, same uh, the, the 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 channel hopping dance. And the thing is, it changes channels uh, 100 times a second. So yeah, that's pretty fast. And if you look at the Killer B framework, you can set a channel, but uh, it goes through the serial uh, communication, the virtual UART. Uh, then it needs to be picked up by the firmware and so, okay, I need to tune in to, into channel 15 or so. And at that time, the current time slot passed, so you're always too late. So the only way to, uh, to accomplish this is actually um, put, the firm, the, put the hopping logic into the firmware, um, which was yeah, quite an endeavor. Uh, especially because uh, neither of us has an embedded uh, developer background. So we had to learn it the hard way. Yeah, normally we break things, we don't make things. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's where the pain started. Uh, the software development kit of NXP came with uh, yeah, a kind of framework, a sort of abstraction layer for um, and underneath it, it, it could use the um, free Artos as an operating system, and it has, uh, and it also had a bare metal scheduler library, something type of thing. Um, it was the documentation was okay, but I had to write uh, to read it uh, three or four times to actually start understanding what was going on and what it did. So I thought, well, a real-time real operating system, I should be able to pull this off. So I read about the timers and started programming the timers. And I asked the timer politely to execute my code every 10 milliseconds. It turned out that that was not exactly true. So uh, if you program ti timers, apparently it's guaranteed that your code will be called, but uh, not exactly at the time you program it. Uh, in the best case, yes. Uh, in most cases, uh, later. So uh, when you need to start to tune in on channel, you are, are already too late. And apparently it got more accurate, uh, accurate when using uh, powers of two. 
So I thought, well, maybe I, my code should be my uh, code should be called every eight milliseconds. Then, um, well, okay, that was slightly better, and it was in time uh, to uh, to tune in on the channel. But then, uh, yeah, other things happened uh, because my code called uh, uh, was called so frequently. Obviously, other tasks uh, got starved. So th the uh, serial communication uh, uh, it blocks, and it was not able to uh, to grab pictures from uh, from the wireless interface and all kinds of nasty things. So uh, that design uh, went into uh, the DevNull, and I looked into the bare metal scheduler that uh, that came with uh, the framework, which is uh, yeah, pretty bare bones. Um, it assumes uh, you define uh, a set of tasks and uh, it has a loop, an endless loop, and your task will eventually be called by the scheduler, but once you have control, yeah, you're responsible for releasing the resource again, so just exit this loop and make sure that your task does not execute longer than two millisec milliseconds or so. Um, so uh, that was that turned out to be yeah, the the more successful approach. Mm. The thing is, we had to do quite some parsing of the protocol because, uh, as uh, we explained, you have these advertisements and these contain actually the useful information. So we are supposed. Uh, Suppose we would like to tune in to uh, join slots, for example. Those are the assigned, the designated slots that uh, new devices will use to actually join the network. And therefore, our text set would be useful to tune into these and uh, intercept handshakes, for example. Um, so, um, uh, th 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 that's okay. <laughs> Um, oh, I lost track of where I got, but um, so back to, back to uh, what the design looked like. So uh, the, uh, it got com complicated when uh, when. Um, uh, needing to parse all these uh, these packets, and actually I had to chop that up in in several tasks uh, that uh, run for yeah, l less than two milliseconds uh, to uh, not interfere with the rest of the frameworks. So on the left part of this slide, you see the tasks that are executed by uh, by the the framework itself, and on the right side you uh, see the task we implemented ourselves. So um, actually I had a module for uh, for parsing the 802.15.4 Mac uh, layer. Um, yeah, that contains source destination addresses and uh, the network ID. And on top of that, we had a task to process the protocol specific, specific sorry, uh, parts or the application layer basically and that's where the interesting uh, data resides so the time slots the channels that we need to um, to tune into the interesting time slots like the join slots earlier so um, our timers went uh, went uh, overboard so uh, we had to come up with a different approach so we figured that probably we could get away with not tuning in to ev each and every uh, single time slot um, because in a super frame, uh, depending on the network size, only um, um, a percentage of, uh, of a super frame is actually occupied with, uh, with uh, time slots. So. Uh, that gives, gives us some uh, some room to play. So suppose that we calculate that we're interested in these uh, 
blue time, uh, marked time slots, uh, we can get away with uh, figuring out what is the current uh, time, and what sequence number are we at, uh, what is the next slot we are interested in, oh, that's uh, 38 mi milliseconds away, okay, we can safely tune into this uh, channel, and uh, once our code gets called again, we can figure out what the next interesting uh, channel is, so we are always in time uh, to capture the traffic uh, we are interested in. And yeah, I'll show you a re recorded demo of exactly doing that. So I abused the channel option for the KillerB framework uh, to accept it to be zero. And that will trigger actually the channel hopping logic. So it starts listening into the advertisements of the network, in this case wireless heart. And as you, I will play, replay it. Oh, here you can see it. Here you can see that it picks up the packets from the different channels. So it's following the hopping pattern. Yeah, so it doesn't show it in the wire shark output, but what you could see maybe is that there were more advertisements than before, so they come in quicker after each other. So what we, can we do, uh, even without knowing anything about uh, the encrypted packets uh, or having keys to actually interact? We can do some primitive attacks that as far as we know, have never have been demonstrated before. So if we, for example, um, if we start uh, jamming the slots where the advertisements are sent, uh, the, uh, the transmitters in the network are not able to properly sync uh, an eventual uh, loose connection. So, <coughs> Another approach is uh, jamming the join slots, so in that case you will prevent new devices from joining the network. And if you manage to uh, force a, a rejoin, you will knock off sensors from uh, from the network. And in practice that means that, uh, that the control room gets blind, it doesn't get any sensor values and controllers uh, will, might react on this by uh, going into uh, emergency shutdown mode, which obviously is very bad if you're running a refinery or gas plant. Also, uh, you could start transmitting fake advertisements. The fake advertisements are signed with, uh, uh, with a well-known key, so it's rather trivial to spoof that and yeah, you might end up uh, uh, with transmitters actually uh, trying to connect to your network. It's the sort of evil twin uh, basically. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's quite similar. So here we have a demonstration where we actually jam the advertisement slots. So on the victim end, we're, to simulate this, we're running a sniffer on and actually, during this demo, the wireless gateway was running and sending advertisements. And you'll see that soon. Here are the regular advertisements. And on the attacker side, we start jamming these advertisements a lot. And it'll take some time to reset the USB device, and yes, it's enabling the jammer, and on the victim end, you will soon see that the advertisements will stop. If you coming in, and here, it is silent. So at this point, um, a, a transmitter will probably decide if it doesn't see the advertisements anymore, it will stop sending uh, the, uh, the measurements. Yep, it's silence. So imagine what you can, uh, can do 
if you get hold of the encryption keys. So yeah, we know we can dump them from uh, uh, hardware acquired through eBay, for example. And if you know that that's from a particular site, yeah, you can you might actually attempt to interact with the network, so send false uh, sensor values. Yeah, another interesting attack is uh, that once you are able to uh, craft valid packets that have a valid signature, uh, that you can um, even if if you even if you don't have uh, the the encryption key that is, uh, you can just uh, start um, uh, fuzzing a certain field in uh, in this packet, and if it is a valid signature for a particular um, for a particular uh, non-scounter value. And it is higher than the one that the, the receiving end expects. Uh, it will accept that high value, and it will discard all legitimate packets with a uh, lower counter value, yeah, which effectively uh, causes again that uh, your control system will will break. And ultimately, if you do uh, uh, manage to, to get hold of the keys, you can actually spoof uh, a sensor completely and send process values that, uh, so you can interfere with the process. Um, the con conclusions are that uh, this is still a large uh, unexplored attack surface. So mainly because no tools existed, and with our research, we would like to promote uh, um, the research in this field. So we'd like to uh, invite you to uh, <laughs> to help us with uh, um, you know with uh, coming up with uh, with uh, new attacks. Uh, yeah, this opens the door to uh, fuzzing the wireless layer of these type of networks. And as you might be aware of, uh, this can could lead to uh, buffer overflow type of vulnerabilities in uh, in, the, in these type of devices. Um, the we will release these tools. Currently, yeah, we are kind of cleaning up uh, because uh, I feel a little bit ashamed of the mess we left. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we will soon release these tools on, on GitHub, so you can check it out. Uh, the NXP device, you can order it through you know, common channels, and it is um, about 50 or 60 bucks. Something like that, yeah. yeah. It's, it's not so too it's really expensive. affordable. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, um, we, we uh, got feedback from the industry that uh, they've gotten so accustomed with this technology and quite confident because it works so well uh, that apparently they're considering to use this technology not only for measuring process values but also for control which we think is really scary <laughs> yeah remember the the feedback loop i showed you in the beginning of the presentation so not only the measuring part but also the controlling part so basically the full loop is going to be wireless And yeah, for future research, we have this on our, our agenda. So there are several theorized attacks already um, from 2009, which we actually can implement now with these, this basic tool set. Uh, already mentioned, if you can force rejoins of a device, um, you can either knock them off the, the existing network, but you can also um, um, entice them to join your network, so the evil twin attack, and you could control uh, the entire sensor network. Um, war driving, also something uh, we'd like to um, to, uh, to do. No, so if our colleague managed to solder on the tiny uh, connector, uh, yeah, we would like to uh, to see what's around. In industrial areas, and see uh, you know, how large this of a problem might be. 
And of course, uh, this will open up the doors to find implementation specific vulnerabilities in the devices. And that's at the point where we probably yeah, get to uh, involve uh, vendors about uh, uh, yeah, uh, and, and, and hope they will yeah, come up with, uh, with proper solutions. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, code will be soon available on, the, on this GitHub site. And we're uh, ready to take any questions. Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, we can do quick questions and then move to the lunch. So, anyone wants to ask a question? I guess everyone is hungry. <laughs> yeah, I guess. So. <laughs> you can always <laughs> approach them after. Um, of course, we'll be uh, around so, here. So, thank you very much. Uh,